Now for today, I wanted to, as Brian said, welcome to WEC. Uh, for me, this is one of the most exciting times on campus here because it is student-led and, and just I, I love to see the student involvement and how they lead the conference and get us involved, all of us, into this week. But today I wanted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Chris McGuffey, better known as Guff. And I don't know Chris a whole lot, but anyone that knows him just calls him Guff. And I think he, he speaks so as it, for, uh, about himself as Guff. So if you see him, just say, hey, Guff. Is that okay, Chris? All right, that's okay. He's, so he said that's fine. So, But Guff, Dr. McGuffey, uh, is a former student here at DTS, was a former student, graduated in 1993. He also is uh, a former graduate or graduate of Texas A&M University. I put that in purposely because I knew I would get that. <laughs> I knew that would come. Uh, but Chris and his, uh, his family spent a better part of the year, their, their lives with Crew, Campus Crusade for Christ, serving mostly overseas, helping to pioneer campus ministries in creative access countries. Having helped raise indigenous staff in this, in this former Soviet Union, East Asia, Greece, and also, um, Gulf's academic interests have led him to receive a doctorate degree in strategic leadership. Guff now serves as pastor of ministry strategies as, at Grace Bible Church in College Station, Texas, where he has the privilege of investing in the development of key ministry leaders, helping to formulate church-wide strategies for discipleship and engagement, and piloting a church planting residency as well. Guff has been married to his wife, Amy, for 25 years, and they have three young men attending college. Guess where they're going to college? <laughs> That's right. Whoop. Yeah. Okay, I'm not an Aggie guy, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't even try, right? Yeah. So uh, just please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris McGuffey, Guff as our plenary speaker for WEC 2021. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much for our friends, our friends, our friends, our friends, our friends. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. As I said last night, it's an honor it really is an honor to be able to come back, to drift back into uh, a place where uh, much of my own theological framework was formed. A lot of my friends uh, at the church were asking, hey, is this kind of a scary moment for you? Uh, and I texted back with uh, Ryan Pale, one of, my, uh, one of my colleagues, and he said, hey, how you feeling about it? And I just wrote back and said, well, it's either a career ender or a career extender. <laughs> and you guys will get to vote at the end. And find out which direction I'm headed. Many of us were taught by our parents not to start out con uh, conversations with a controversy. Um, but okay, we're a safe group, right? We're in these hallowed halls of Dallas Theological Seminary, and I think we should be able to stand before one another and tell the truth. So I have some confessions that I need to make some things that I need to put out there for you to understand a bit about who I am in the context uh, of why I maybe even got invited here to speak. And the first thing is this. As Dr. Ortiz said, I am a Texas Aggie. Okay, we got a little silent ones going on over there. <laughs> Everywhere we go, we cause a bit of a commotion. Okay, people keep asking, what? are they doing down there? <laughs> and I just remind people that, you know, one person's cult is another person's family. <laughs> and it is prevalent. Okay. You can't really hate the Aggies too much. We're the nice people of the SEC. Uh, and we send so many people to Dallas Theological Seminary that I think that we make your tuition cheaper. <laughs> okay. So lighten up a little bit. But Texas A&M and College Station in particular, I don't know why, but it seems to be a place where God is moving. He has been moving there for years, and it seems like he will continue 
to move for another generation. And we provide counselors for your kids to go to summer camp. We, uh, we provide lots of leaders and volunteers, at least in the Texas churches where you might go on to serve. We provide more students uh, to the non-denominational Baptist and Catholic seminaries than any other university in the United States. And we send laborers to the gospel frontier. And that might be our most redeeming quality. That's a joke, people. Okay, we're here for three more days, so keep up with me, all right? My spiritual life was deeply impacted at Texas A&M University. And for that, I'm truly thankful. And I'm thankful enough that I get to go back and see if I can make a difference to keep the, the flywheel spinning towards people coming to Christ and being sent to the world. The second thing you, know, you need to know about me is that I only got a Master of Arts at DTS. How did the guy get the mic, you know? <laughs> what, 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 what happened here, okay? I came in as a public school, uh, state school hack in education, realizing that when I sat in my first few classes at Dallas Theological Seminary, I had trouble understanding the questions being asked, much less the answers being given. I was far behind and I needed to catch up fast. In a very funny way, I ended up getting to know a few of the profs and one of them was one of Dallas Theological Seminary's great theologians, Dr. Harold Honer. And even after I graduated with my Master of Arts in Biblical Studies, Dr. Honer would love to ask me, son, when are you gonna come back and finish your degree? My answer to him was when I don't have to read an 800 page, 3.1 pound book on Ephesians, which is a, a letter in my Bible that only takes up three pages. <laughs> and when I say I answered him, I mean I quietly muttered that to myself. <laughs> Truthfully, my academic career hadn't been stellar. It took me six years to graduate from Texas A&M with a 2.4 grade point average Get it? In political science. <laughs> there are many reasons why that was true, and none of those reasons were the reasons I was asked to speak. <laughs> the only reason I got into DTS in the early 90s, in the early 90s is that DTS needed my money. <laughs> you think I'm joking, but ask a few of the profs that are still around. <laughs> they were publishing books for lunch money. But I picked it up from there and I found that I actually love to learn. I found some deep passions and my education continued. And I found out that I was just an, a late academic bloomer. And after a slow start, I ended up uh, in some form of school, funny enough, for the next 20 years. And while my THM friends had continued on to study their dead languages of Greek and Hebrew, I went on to study uh, Russian, Chinese, and modern Greek, which is a language where the verbs still continue to change. <laughs> it's a crazy process. But because I was interested in the intersection of where mission strateg missions, strategy, and leadership development continued to collide, I continued on in my education. I've even started picking up new areas to expand into. At 47, I finished my doctorate. At 48, I started gardening. At 50, I learned how to play the drums. At 52, I bought a school bus and turned it into an RV. At 53, I ended up having to learn how to weld to make that project possible. <laughs> and at 54, I learned how to speak while wearing a mask and my hand sopped in antiseptic whatever that stuff is, cleanser. And things just continue to get crazy in Texas. But I found that there's still so much more to learn. The third thing I need to confess to you is that I was a missionary. And I always will be one. In layman's terms, that means that living overseas, I missed 16 out of 55 Super Bowls because of Jesus. I missed a lot more than that because I'm a Cowboys fan. 
I cut my teeth, my missionary teeth, by moving to the Soviet Union just out of college. I'm sorry, mom and dad, for the nervousness <laughs> that I caused you. But it was an opportunity that I just couldn't pass up. Given the era, the era in 1990 and the Cold War, I felt like I had literally moved outside the gates of hell to bring good news to a people who wanted to hear. And God was gracious to use a young, an obstinate, a very unprepared person on an unprepared team to lead a number of people to the Lord and to help start a campus ministry. And in those years, God impacted my life quite a bit. As I realized I wanted to invest a number of years overseas, I was sitting, I remember sitting at my desk this one day, I was uh, living in Tbilisi in the, uh, uh, the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, and I was staring at the most confusing part of my Bible trying to understand what was happening. It was the table of contents, and I couldn't fit it all together. And so I decided that if my goal was going to be uh, to live in a place on the gospel frontier where the churches were not so present to help me out, I better go get a little bit of theological education. And so I came to DTS. In those conversations, something funny happened. When I told people that I was going to go to seminary, the missionaries on the field, they told me that they thought that was a waste of time. And when I got here to DTS and people found out that when I graduated, I wanted to go back overseas, people told me they couldn't understand why I wouldn't want to work for a local church. And so I sat in that gap, wondering how the Lord would have my calling begin to play out. So after graduation, I joined staff with crew and spent three years in what I call the remotest parts of the earth. Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> I was on staff at Texas Tech University, uh, but shortly after that, I moved back to spend uh, the most formative part of my life overseas. In 1996, in three duffel bags as a newly married missionary, my wife and I would leave this beautiful country, and then we would return home 15 years later with three kids in a 20-foot shipping container with story after story of God's faithfulness. As for me, still in some ways, living in the U.S. can be a bit of an uncomfortable place. When people ask me how in this process of moving back home I was coping, I would tell them that I like to keep a little bag of dissatisfaction with me and feed it crackers <laughs> because I never wanted to fully fit in to this place that other people kept calling home. We wanted to just be in our next place of ministry. We didn't know how long we would stay. But the struggle to settle is enormous. So after serving on the gospel frontier, places that I would say with little to no indigenous witness, I now quite possibly live in the most evangelized academic center on the planet Earth. And we have to ask ourselves why. When we came back to Grace Bible, our sending church, we were very excited. It was exciting to be back among the people that had sent us, among the people that had prayed for us, among the people that had helped us to shape some of the fervor for the nations. So we went back to church. We sat like normal people. Missionaries don't get to do that very often in church. We sat like normal people in the pews, sitting in English, listening to a great band as we worshiped. I looked over to my wife and she was crying. So I asked her, what is it, baby? Why are you crying in church today? And she said, look at all these people praising and worshiping God all in one place. It's just amazing. And that day we enjoyed the great blessing 
of what was happening in our church. One week goes by, back in the same church, back in the same pew, back with the same people listening to the same band. I look over at my wife and she's crying. And my wife, she's not much of a crier. But I ask, hey, what's going on? Why are you crying? And she said, look at all these people praising and worshiping God all in one place when there are so many people who haven't heard. It took us seven days, seven days to go from the blessing to the burden of the American church. So now, as we get started, like good academicians, we need to define a few of our terms for what we're going to talk about over the, the course of the next few days. I want to differentiate between a couple of different terms that get thrown around. I'm not trying to lock down the definition. I'm just trying to be clear with what we're talking about for these days. And you will find out that these terms are used in all kinds of strategies in all kinds of church settings. But here's how we're going to talk about it this week. The words are this mission, missional and missionary. You will ultimately decide how these will be used. But for this week, this is how we're going to talk about it as a difference in strategy and all too often a difference in resourcing. A mission, which is a word that's sometimes hot swappable with the word vision, is a term that refers to the overall responsibility of the church. It's the biggest statement of what it is that God has told you to do. This is what you put on your, web, your website, what you put on your t-shirts, what's on your church coffee mugs, and what's hanging in your foyer. At Grace Bible Church, we say we help people find and follow Jesus. Missional is a little bit different. This is a biblical way of living. It's the incarnational life that is centered around the kingdom of God instead of our own selfish desires. It is the recognition that the power of the church rests in the obedience of its people, not in the structures of the building, not in the programming of the pastors. But missions, well, that's a different term after all. That's a term that I'll reserve for something else. It's not just the outflow of the gospel message from the congregation, but it has to do with that specific part that is done to help fulfill the Great Commission where the global church needs more help to, to gain critical mass. It also serves as those, uh, it also serves those tongues, tribes, and nations that are still unreached peoples, those with less than 2% indigenous witness. And tomorrow we're going to talk more about uh, how our churches and how our organizations are charged to finish that task. Now, as you walked in here today, I don't really know what you're expecting. As you signed on for this, I don't know what you were expecting. Missionaries. Long collars, slideshows, some stories of strange people and stranger food, all given by an out of shape, washed up, non-relatable mumbler who has since lost track of his own cultural awareness. I don't mumble. The rest of it, we'll see. <laughs> I am a bit out of shape, but you can't really blame me for that. When I left this country to go uh, overseas, the preaching ship was home by normal looking guys. When I came back, you have to have biceps the size of my thighs and a beard as long as Moses to plant a church. <laughs> and they say missionaries are crazy. I am a bit out of shape, but you can't. Hold that against me, I hope. But don't get me wrong, I, am not, I know that I am a part of a passing generation. At 54 years of age, I have seen and experienced three lifetimes of cultures, countries, and languages. And the scary part is not that you might have to sit through my dated presentation on the Great Commission. 
What should scare you is that when my generation ages out, the weight of the nations will sit firmly in your observational, interpretational, and applicational laps. That's for you, Prof. Hendricks. I am here to ask you, what are you going to do with that level of responsibility? Does it feel like an unwanted burden? Or does it feel like an incredible opportunity? And how you answer that question will tell me a lot about how we spend our time together this week. Here's a confession. When giving talks, I like subtitles. Why do I like subtitles? Well, I find it's the most way to be just a little snarky from the pulpit. Okay, take this talk for example. The official title is The Calling of Every Believer. It's a little ubiquitous, right? But a subtitle allows me to talk about the things I really want to talk about. And the subtitle that I have given this talk is this. Why even come? Does anybody get the reference? You see, when I got my initial invitation to come and speak at my alma mater, I was honored. And I hadn't even begun to think about what it is that I wanted to say. But working at a church where probably 90 plus percent of our pastors went to Dallas Theological Seminary, I wandered over into a colleague's office to tell him the good news. And he uttered these three words. Why even come? What do you mean? And this was his reply. He said the joke around DTS during the days that he was here, especially from the guys chasing church jobs, was WEC week, W-E-C, why even come? That wasn't his personal feeling. He actually went over to serve overseas, but it was still the first thing that came to his mind. Why even come? Funny, right? I laughed. And then it lit a fire in my belly that you will have to pay for for the rest of this week. <laughs> you might be saying, I never said that. But it's too late. <laughs> what happens in the preaching world where pastors have to vent their spleens over life messages, you have stepped into the world of what I would call collateral damage. And I don't feel bad about it at all. For the next few days, you will be victims of my passions, but I pray that you will not be, perpe uh, that you will not be perpetuators of a flippant attitude towards the world evangelization that needs to happen in the coming years. You see, when we get a fire in our belly, it becomes more than just a sermon. It becomes a lifelong stewardship. And my passage today, while familiar to all, serves as one of the life verses that has come to govern my biggest decisions. Though not strictly seen as a great commission passage or a missions verse, it has everything to do with serving Jesus. So let's read it together in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. Therefore, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending to ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For we are beside ourselves. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Now all things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Because he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For my wife and I, this is one of the clearest, most convicting, most formative treaties uh, on the purpose for our very being. It has become a standard by, uh, by which we must live and a filter by which we must make decisions. And quite frankly, my wife and I are often found lacking. Nevertheless, is one of our life verses, this is the road sign for all of our years. The issue with the church today isn't so different than it is uh, in Paul's day. It seems like there was this group of people that had become self-commending people that figured out how to look good doing the job instead of, how, uh, instead of looking into how doing the job good. I know that grammar demands well, but it messed up my verbal balance. <laughs> Paul states that he didn't want to be commended for what it looked like he was doing. It isn't about his presentation or his personal stats. It is, the, it is not in the appearance that God is pleased. Like an internet influencer with a viral reputation. But it is about the substance of what he was doing because of his love for Jesus and his love for the nations. For the young in the audience, you're just understanding that life isn't always so easy for those of us that have been around the rough and tumble block of ministry. We understand that life is difficult. And I love how this passage basically starts out by saying, if you're in the ministry, you're a little nuts. You're a little crazy. And Paul says, if I look crazy, it's only because of my love for you. But that's why our calling is so important. It's not the, just the specific instruction of, uh, to individuals about where their ministry will play out, but it's the overarching challenge to every believer who wants to make a difference. And the deeper our conviction, the clearer our calling, the better chance that we have to stick to it. This passage, while beautiful, carries some pretty heavy implications for those of us who follow Christ. The first implication is this, that those who live might no longer live for themselves. You're probably thinking, well, now the missionary has gone and forgot that he's talking to pastors and ministers, right? Well, let me ask you a question. If we're being honest about our commitment to the nations, then someone needs to continue to explain to me that how so many of you who have traveled so far to end up here upon graduation will end up so close to here when so many more over there are waiting for men and women who will no longer live for themselves, but who will live for him and die, who died and rose again on their behalf. It seems that the gravity of Dallas-Fort Worth is stronger than the pool of so many other places. I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right? It needs to be made clear that I am not standing in judgment of your calling. That is not my purpose here this week but I am going to make a comparison to what God has asked us, the church, to do with the data of what has been happening for years. And we have to pause and take a serious look at what is happening with the distribution of God's resources in relationship to his command. As for the other implications of this passage, you know as well as I do where this passage goes. 
God in his lavish grace, in his reckless mercy, in his unthinkable plan and what seems to risk perilous outcomes, he gives to us, his failing children, the ministry of reconciliation. That's right, after leaving the glory of his father's side, after living a perfect life on earth, after being disbelieved and misunderstood, after being arrested and punished and crucified by men and women that are no different than you and me, after rising from the dead and ascending back to his rightful place, he turns to us and says, my most beautiful gift will be delivered to the whole world by your own hands and feet. The ministry of reconciliation. And through his word and the Holy Spirit, we aren't supposed to spend that gift on ourselves, but to steward it to a waiting world. Why even come? My friends, you might not have made the joke, but I promise you the reason isn't why even come to a missions emphasis week at Dallas Theological Seminary because you might not become missionaries. The question is, why even come to Dallas Seminary at all if you're not going to pick up the mantle of the Great Commission and take it to the whole of God's beloved, Panta Ta Ethne? That's right. It isn't just about the content of the job. It is also about the scope of the work. Second Corinthians 5 reminds us that we are not just to be his representatives telling others what he said, but we are to be ambassadors embodying the kingdom with our very lives. Thinking back about my Walt Baker story, I don't know how it got so emblazoned into my mind or nor the effects that it had in total of my life. But I remember a story that he told when he was living in Haley. Uh, Haiti is a lowly missionary. And he got invited to the president of Haiti's house for a banquet. And he began to worry about his presence there. He didn't have the right clothes to wear. He had to go and borrow a jacket to put on. He knew that there would be ambassadors from all other countries that were there and he didn't want to embarrass his host. He had to borrow a Jeep, a ramshackle Jeep to drive up to the palace to hand over to the man who would park his car and slink into the house, finding the furthest seat away from the action so that he wouldn't even be noticed. But in the midst of of all of the ambassadors that were there, the president stood up and said, called him to the front to sit by his side and said, all of you here represent great nations, but my friend Walt represents the kingdom of God. And we should listen to what he says. And that's our attitude. We are not to slink into the rest of the world. We're not to become haughty and proud and demanding, but we carry with us the very calling of God. As pastors and ministers and elders and deacons and part-time and full-time or volunteer leaders, we are not merely tasked to call out to those who are passing by our churches, but also to send out missionaries trained and equipped to communicate the whole of God's word to a people who haven't heard and to help them understand how to reach their nation and their neighbors with the love of Jesus, people that are controlled and compelled by the love of Christ. And some of us are supposed to pack our bags and pack our books and to pack our families and our futures and to move to where pastors and ministers are still too few. And the church has yet to be planted. Have you seriously considered your calling? Let me close with a question that separates our participation today from the communal and mandatory nature of your attendance here today. Why did you come? 
Why did you come to this event? And why have you chosen to be engaged? Is it because you had to? I can live with that. That puts you in the path of this conversation. Is it because God is stirring a quiet interest in your heart that just won't go away? My bet is that of those in this room and in this building and listening online, that you know who I'm talking to. My challenge to you is to stoke that fire. Or is it because you sense your stewardship is to lead either your current or your future church into the global harvest? There are ways to make that happen. And we're going to talk about those ways in the coming days. People used to ask me. People ask missionaries funny questions. People used to ask me, what is the most difficult part of being a missionary? And for a while, I really didn't know how to answer that question. But over time, it became a little clearer. And it's probably not what you think. It isn't the travel. It's not the separation. It isn't the support raising and having to trust the Lord with your financial future. It isn't the missing of weddings and the missing of births, the sickness and the deaths of all the loved ones. It isn't the difficult attaining of residence visas learning languages, or finding educational options for your kids. And it certainly isn't the host cultures or the people that you meet. These are all pretty difficult at times. But I think what rose to the top was this subtle loneliness that exists that comes from being a part of a very few who have responded to a call that has been given to so many. It isn't that every person has to go. But it is that every person has to walk past that opportunity and to consider it deeply. And it is that every church has the responsibility to send. This is how the responsibility of the Great Commission is shared. It's the collective nature of our calling. My request is that in the midst of all the homework and the tasks, the work and the family, that you will take a few times this week to really listen to what the Lord is saying about your calling to serving. Because the work of clarifying our calling can only happen as we are fully controlled, fully compelled by the love of Christ. The task has never been bigger. The opportunity has never been greater and the church has never been more distracted than it is right now. As individuals, as a church, as a seminary, and as the church, what will we choose to emphasize in our teaching and our decisions? Will we call our people to the Great Commission in obedience? What will our theological framework add to the fulfillment of the task? So my question to you is this. Are you willing to journey together this week? Are you willing to face this thematic question that stares each of us in the face today? Are we willing to do whatever it takes? Last night I gave a homework assignment to the willing and that was this, to tell somebody that you know today that you're going to be totally open to consider your future and do whatever the, law, the Lord is calling you to do this week. And I want to add to that another homework challenge. Today, I want you to identify your biggest barrier that keeps you from moving towards the unreached people groups that have yet to hear the gospel and then ask yourself if God can overcome that barrier if you're willing to let him. Let me pray. Father, we do journey with you this week, not just the students, but the rest of the faculty, me personally, my family, all of us together 
because we cannot come to your word and to read passages like we read and walk away unchanged. Lord, will you clarify to us the opportunities that we have to serve you in unique ways that has the furthest, most effective, and most strategic reach into the places on our planet that have yet to hear the gospel message for people who have yet to come to know you. And I pray that through your spirit, you would give us the confidence to step towards whatever it takes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.